The thing that I perceived, and as you'll hear uh, from, uh, from Ian Stewart and so on, is that global warming is it's a personal thing. It belongs to you and me. The problem is that it just doesn't feel like it, so people are not responding. If the human race was to get graded on their CO2 emissions, they'd get an F. Lots of effort, but bottom line, CO2 is on the rise. And it's that factor that it's not personal to the man or woman in the street. My particular journey here is that in years gone past, I was a heavy CO2 emitter with a welly-sized carbon footprint, and I never gave it a thought, like many. But I sold my business in 2003. I decided to opt for the good life, and things changed. I was a sailor, and my wife and I, we bought a boat, and we decided we'd like to do what I'd always wanted to do, and we went for a circumnavigation. So we left Plymouth, well actually we left Ipswich first, sailed the way around, went to the Med, sailed to the Canaries, and then the long one, first long one, across to the Caribbean. Uh, it's a long way, I can tell you, and uh, we lived on the yacht for six months. It was just my wife and I, it was no mega yacht, just a wee little thing, uh, but the thing is that sailors of any <coughs> yacht, any craft, they live by the environment. And that's where I changed. Going to the simple life, living close to the water, close to the environment, I realised that there was something here that was actually happening. Part of it was that I was actually brought up in Nassau in the Bahamas. Dad was a Methodist missionary and head teacher of Queen's College, uh, the Methodist school out there. And we lived there for, uh, for until 72. And as kids, we would fish and dive every day. It was a hard life, but, you know, we made it and we came back. When I was living on the yachts uh, in the Caribbean in 2004, <coughs> what I saw was the change that had occurred in the reefs, in the fish. It was there. You could see it. In my lifetime, I could see the change. And it was one of those things that you just can't walk away from. That was the personal realization. We'll hear later on from Dr. Ian Stewart how he had a similar, not on the yacht, but in terms of changing from uh, ambivalence, looking at it, sitting by it, and then becoming part of it. I heard a fascinating quote a while back. Uh, you might have heard it. It was uh, from Jonas Salk. If all the insects of the planet were to disappear, within 50 years, all life would cease to exist. If all humans were to disappear, all life would flourish. And I think that that makes an essential point. This global cooking thing is not about the planet. It is about people. And it is only our arrogance that allows us to say that we are killing the planet. The planet will be here in a billion years' time. It is the most intelligent species on the planet, the most intelligent species they have ever known, and we're going to be the first <coughs> on the planet to eradicate ourselves if we don't do something. And that is how smart we are. That point led me to believe that there may be an argument to say that most adults are beyond repair. We're too locked in a way of life. It is too easy to resort to tokenism. And I believe that to meet this greatest of challenges, we need a whole new creativity. So I started thinking, where would I find people who don't see boundaries? Where would I find people who are not frightened of being wrong? And where would I find people with the enthusiasm and the energy to care enough to make a real change, and that was the beginning of the idea. I realized that the people I was talking about were our children. Kids will take a chance. If they don't know, they will have a go. I'm not really one for stories, but I heard a great one recently uh, by uh, a great educationalist called uh, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, the story goes uh, a, a bit like this. Uh, there was a teacher, apparently, in an art class uh, in an infant school, and uh, she had a, what was a usually challenging child at the back of the classroom, uh, a little girl. She uh, goes, uh, she's, the little girl's focused. Uh, she's doing something. She's not being a nuisance. So the teacher goes up to, uh, to the child and uh, asks her what she's doing. The child says, uh, well, actually, I'm drawing a picture of God. And uh, the teacher looks rather startled and looks back and says, but nobody knows what God looks like. 
And the child says, well, they will in five minutes. <laughs> and that, I think, is bringing that ability to look at things in a different way, which we want to try and grasp. Sometimes the solution is actually just so simple. We all know that children have a capacity for innovation, and even though it might be said we do our best to train it out of them, it remains. I also thought that children starting school this year will be retiring in 2068. And what on earth sort of planet will it be for them then? We simply do not know for sure, but if anyone has an interest, they have an interest. And maybe most importantly, I like any parent would do anything for my lad. If there is one person who is able to make me feel passion, it is my son. He's here today, hiding away probably at the back there. And so it seemed to me, if people would not save the world for themselves, the chances are that they would for their children. If my son came to me and said, Dad, I want you to change and save the world for me, would you do it? Damn right I would. And I think that a lot of people would do that if they have children who ask. I love my son enough to save the world, and I believe millions of parents do too. So all we have to do is give our children the authority to ask, the means to, de to deliver a structure and a status that has influence and which allows their parents to respond. And what better than walking the talk, putting their own house in order, the schools. And that is what Green It Like You Mean It is all about. Giving children the chance to care, the opportunity to express to the world at large that they are doing something. To shame the adults who don't accept their responsibility, not by talking, but by doing real hard action that cuts CO2 emissions. And millions of tons of them at that if we hit our targets. The message for our children is simple. We can do it. It is not too late. We have the technology. We have the ability. We can do it, and we can do it now. So let's do it. It is a people thing. It is about people you love, not the planet, not any other species. It's about people eradicating people. And finally, it's about the next generation. If our children think they can leave it to the adults, they may find that they are the losers. Our vision is for Green It Like You Mean It to, uh, is to allow our children to make a huge difference. We want them to own and drive a campaign that eradicates hundreds of thousands of tons of CO2. And with our support, if they get up a real head of steam, using solar power of course, they can cut millions of tonnes of CO2. Education is a major polluter, but our children can do something they can be proud of. They can lead the world in what they do, showing the world that the country that gave industrialization can give the lead in making a new future. But I believe that the only way that we can do this is if we see our children for the hope that they are. And that is our task, to enable our children to face this future with security and <coughs> confidence and belief. We may not see this future, but they will. So I hope that you will accept our invitation to create the opportunity to allow every child to ask, please save the world <coughs> for me. And for our nation's educators to stand right there beside them encouraging and supporting as is their vocation. <laughs>